On the 29th of September 1918, the German Supreme Army Command at Imperial Army Headquarters in Spa, Belgium, informed Kaiser Wilhelm II and the Imperial Chancellor or Prime Minister Count George von Hutten that the military situation facing Germany was hopeless. General Erich Ludendorff, probably fearing a breakthrough by the Allies, claimed that he could not guarantee that the front would hold for long and demanded that a request be given to the Allies for an immediate ceasefire. In addition, he recommended the acceptance of the main demands of US President Woodrow Wilson, which included reforming the imperial government as a democracy, which he hoped would bring more favorable peace terms. This also enabled him to save the reputation of the Imperial German Army and put the responsibility for the surrender and its consequences squarely on the shoulders of the Democratic parties and the Parliament. He expressed his view to officers of his staff on the 1st of October, saying, They now must lie on the bed that they've made for us. On the 3rd of October 1918, the Liberal Prince Maximilian of Baden was appointed Chancellor, replacing Hurting in order to negotiate an armistice. After long conversations with Kaiser Wilhelm II and evaluations of the political and military situations in the country, by the 5th of October 1918, the German government sent a message to Wilson to negotiate terms on the basis of his 14 points. It seemed that the German leadership did not quite comprehend the consequences of Wilson's demands. As Ferdinand Cernan, author of Versailles 1919, explained, in the two exchanges that followed, Wilson's hints failed to convey the idea that the Kaiser's abdication was an essential condition for peace. The leading statesmen of the Reich were not yet ready to contemplate such a monstrous possibility. In addition, as a precondition for negotiations, Wilson demanded the retreat of Germany from all occupied territories, the cessation of submarine activities, and the Kaiser's abdication, writing on the 23rd of October, if the government of the United States must deal with the military masters and the monarchical autocrats of Germany now, or if it is likely to have to deal with them later in regard to the international obligations of the German Empire, it must demand not peace negotiations, but surrender. In late October 1918, Ludendorff, in a sudden change of mind, declared that the conditions of the Allies were unacceptable. He now demanded that Germany resume the war which he himself had declared lost only a month earlier. However, the German soldiers were desperate to get home. It was almost impossible to motivate soldiers for battle, and desertions were on the increase. The German government stayed on course for peace negotiations, and Ludendorff was replaced by General Wilhelm Gruner. On the 5th of November, the Allies agreed to take up negotiations for a truce, now also demanding reparation payments. The latest note from Wilson was received by the Germans on the 6th of November. That same day, a peace delegation, led by newly appointed Secretary of State Matthias Erzberger, departed for France. A much bigger obstacle, which contributed to the five-week delay in the signing of the armistice and to the resulting social deterioration in Europe, was the fact that most of the Allied nations including Britain and France, refused to accept the 14 points and Wilson's subsequent promises. For example, they assumed that the demilitarization suggested by Wilson would be limited to the central powers only. There were also contradictions with their post-war plans and that did not include a consistent implementation of the ideal of national self-determination. As Cernan points out, the Allied statesmen were faced with the problem so far, they had considered the 14 commandments as a piece of clever and effective American propaganda, designed primarily to undermine the fighting spirit of the central powers and to bolster the morale of the lesser allies. Now, suddenly, the whole peace structure was supposed to be built up on that set of vague principles, most of which seemed to them thoroughly unrealistic, and some of which, if they were to be seriously applied, were simply unacceptable. Meanwhile, the seeds of revolution had been sown within Germany. During the night of the 29th and 30th of October, 
The sailors' revolt in the naval port of Wilhelmshaven spread across the whole country within days and led to the proclamation of a republic on the 9th of November 1918 and to the announcement of the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II. The same day, von Baden handed over the office of Chancellor to Friedrich Ebert, a Social Democrat. Ebert Social Democratic Party, or SPD, and the Erzberger's Catholic Centre Party had enjoyed an uneasy relationship with the German imperial government since Bismarck's era in the 1870s and 1880s. They were well represented in Parliament, but enjoyed little power over the government. However, they had been calling for a negotiated peace since 1917. Their prominence in the peace negotiations would cause the new emerging Weimar Republic to lack legitimacy in the eyes of right-wing and militarist groups. The German delegation headed by Erzberger included Count Alfred von Obendorf from the Foreign Ministry, Major General Detloff von Winterfeld of the Army and Captain Ernst Wanzelow of the Navy. They crossed the front line in five cars and were escorted for 10 hours across the devastated war zone of northern France, arriving on the morning of the 8th of November 1918. They were then taken to the secret destination aboard French General and Allied Supreme Commander General Ferdinand Foch's private train parked in a railway siding in the forest of Compiègne. Foch appeared only twice in the three days of negotiations. He appeared on the first day to ask the German delegation what they wanted and on the last day to view the signatures. The Germans were handed the list of Allied demands and given 72 hours to agree. The German delegation discussed the Allied terms with their French and Allied opposites. The cessation of hostilities known as an armistice amounted to complete German demilitarization with few promises made by the Allies in return. The naval blockade of Germany was not completely lifted until complete peace terms could be agreed upon. There were very few negotiations. The Germans were able to correct a few impossible demands. For example, the decommissioning of more submarines than their fleet possessed. They also managed to extend the schedule for the withdrawal of forces from the fronts and registered their formal protest at the harshness of Allied terms. But they were in no position to refuse to sign. On Sunday the 10th of November, the Germans were shown newspapers from Paris to inform them that the Kaiser had abdicated. That same day, Ebert instructed Erzberger to sign. The cabinet had earlier received a message from General Otto von Hindenburg requesting that the armistice be signed even if the Allied conditions could not be improved on. Erzberger, Obendorf, Winterfeld and Wanzelo signed on behalf of the Germans. The two signatories on behalf of the Allies were Foch as Allied Supreme Commander and First Sea Lord Admiral Rosslyn Wemyss, the British representative. In contrast to the German delegation, the Allied delegation was made up entirely of military personnel. The armistice was agreed upon at 5 a.m. on the 11th of November 1918 to come into effect at 11 a.m. Paris time, for which reason the occasion is sometimes referred to as the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. The armistice was prolonged three times before peace was finally ratified. The first armistice, 11 November 1918 to 13 December 1918, then the first prolongation of the armistice, 13 December 1918 to 16 January 1919, the second prolongation of the armistice, 16 January 1919 to 16 February 1919, then the Traverse Agreement, 17 January 1919, third prolongation of the armistice, 16 February 1919 to 10 January 1920. And then the Brussels Agreement of 14 March 1919, with peace only finally being approved at quarter past 4 p.m. on the 10th of January 1920. The armistice consisted of 34 clauses. Among those clauses were the following major points. Termination of hostilities on the Western Front, on land and in the air within six hours of signature. Immediate evacuation of France, Belgium, Luxembourg and Alsace-Lorraine within 15 days. Sick and wounded may be left for allies to care for. 
immediate repatriation of all inhabitants of those four territories in German hands. Surrender of material, 5,000 artillery pieces, 25,000 machine guns, 3,000 men and waffers, a type of short-range mortar, 1,700 aircraft, 5,000 railway locomotives, 150,000 railway carriages, and 5,000 road trucks. Evacuation of territory on the west side of the Rhine, plus 30 km radius bridgeheads of the east side of the Rhine at the cities of Mainz, Koblenz and Cologne within 30 days. Vacated territory to be occupied by Allied troops and the occupation to be maintained at Germany's expense. No removal or destruction of civilian goods or inhabitants in the evacuated territories and all military material and premises to be left intact. All minefields on land and sea to be identified. All means of communication, roads, railways, canals, bridges, telegraphs, telephones to be left intact as well as everything needed for agriculture and industry. Immediate withdrawal of all German troops in Romania and in what were the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Russian Empire back to German territory as it was on the 1st of August 1914, although tacit support was given to the pro-German West Russian Volunteer Army under the guise of combating the Bolsheviks. The Allies were also to have access to these countries. Renunciation of the Treaty of brest litovsk with Russia and of the Treaty of Bucharest with Romania. Evacuation of German forces in Africa. Immediate cessation of all hostilities at sea and surrender intact of all German submarines within 14 days. Listed German surface vessels to be interned within 7 days and the rest disarmed. Free access to German waters for Allied ships and for those of the Netherlands, Norway, Denmark and Sweden. Crucially, the naval blockade of Germany was to continue. Immediate German and Ottoman evacuation of all Black Sea ports and handover of all captured Russian vessels. Immediate release of all Allied prisoners of war and interned civilians without reciprocity. Pending a financial settlement, surrender by Germany of assets suited from Belgium, Romania and Russia. The British public was notified of the armistice by an official communique issued from the press bureau when British Prime Minister David Lloyd George announced on the 11th of November 1918 The armistice was signed at 5 o'clock this morning and hostilities are to cease on all fronts at 11 a.m. today. An official communique was published by the United States at 2.30 p.m. In accordance with the terms of the armistice, hostilities on the fronts of the American armies were suspended at 11 o'clock this morning. News of the armistice being signed was officially announced at around 9 a.m. in Paris. One hour later, Fach presented himself at the Ministry of War, where he was immediately received by George Clemenceau, the Prime Minister of France. At 10 to 11 a.m., Fach issued this general order. Hostilities will cease on the whole front as from November 11 at 11 o'clock French time, the Allied troops will not, until further order, go beyond the line reached on that date and at that hour. Although the information about the imminent ceasefire had spread among the forces at the front in the hours before, fighting in many sections of the front continued until the last hour. At 11am, there was some spontaneous fraternization between the two sides. But in general, reactions were muted. According to German historian Joran Leonard, one British soldier reported the Germans came from their trenches, bowed to us, and then went away. That was it. There was nothing with which we could celebrate, except cookies. There was some cheering and applause, but according to reports, the dominant feeling among the Allied soldiers was emptiness after more than four exhausting years of war. Many artillery units continued to fire on German targets just so that they did not have to haul away their spare ammunition themselves. The Allies also wished to ensure that, should fighting restart, they would be in the most favourable position. An example of the Allies' intention to maintain pressure until the last minute, but also to adhere strictly to the armistice terms, 
was a battery of 14-inch railway guns of the US Navy that fired its last shot at 10.57 and 30 seconds AM from the Verdun area. The bombardment was timed to land far behind the German front line just before the scheduled armistice. Consequently, there were 10,944 casualties on the Western Front during the last day, of whom 2,738 men died. Augustine Trebuchon was the last Frenchman to die when he was shot on his way to tell fellow soldiers who were attempting an assault across the Meuse River that hot soup would be served after the ceasefire. He was killed at quarter to 11 a.m. Earlier, the last British soldier to die was George Edwin Ellison, who was killed at around 9.30 a.m. while scouting on the outskirts of Mons, Belgium. Henry Gunther, an American, is generally recognized as the last soldier to be killed in action in World War I. He was allegedly killed only 60 seconds before the armistice came into force, while charging towards astonished German troops who were aware the armistice was nearly upon them. News of the armistice only reached African forces about two weeks later. The German and British commanders then had to agree on the protocols for their own armistice ceremony. After the war, there was a deep shame that so many soldiers died on the final day of the war, especially in the hours after the armistice had been signed but had not yet taken effect. In the US, the Congress opened an investigation to find out why and if blame should be placed on the leaders of the American Expeditionary Forces. In France, many graves of French soldiers who died on the 11th of November were backdated to the 10th. The peace between the Allies and Germany was subsequently settled controversially in 1919 by the Paris Peace Conference and the Treaty of Versailles that same year. The Paris Peace Conference was the formal meeting in 1919 and 1920 of the victorious Allies after the end of World War I to set the peace terms for the defeated Central Powers. Dominated by the leaders of Britain, France, the United States and Italy, it resulted in five controversial treaties that rearranged the map of Europe and imposed financial penalties. Germany and the other losing nations had no voice and became embittered for decades. The five powers, France, Britain, Italy, United States and Japan, controlled the conference. The so-called Big Four were French Prime Minister George Clemenceau, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George, US President Woodrow Wilson and Italian Prime Minister Vittorio Emmanuel Orlando. The main result of the conference was the Treaty of Versailles with Germany, signed on the 28th of June 1919 at the Versailles Palace just outside of Paris. Although it's often referred to as the Versailles Conference, only the actual signing of the treaty took place at the historic palace. The Treaty of Versailles required Germany to disarm, make ample territorial concessions and pay reparations to certain countries that had formed the Allied Powers. Article 231 of the treaty placed complete blame on Germany and required Germany to accept the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the loss and damage caused by the war. That provision proved to be humiliating for Germany and set the stage for the expensive reparations that Germany had to pay. In 1921, the total cost of these reparations was assessed at 132 billion German marks. Then, 31.4 billion US dollars, roughly equivalent to 442 billion US dollars today, or 7.3 trillion rand in today's currency. Ultimately, it only paid a small portion before its last payment in 1931. Article 231 would later become known as the War Guilt Clause. German troops were also reduced to 100,000 and the country was prevented from possessing major military armaments such as tanks, warships, armored vehicles and submarines. The treaty formally ended the war. 
At the time, economists, most notably John Maynard Keynes, a British delegate to the Paris Peace Conference, predicted that their treaty was far too harsh and said the reparations figure was excessive and counterproductive. On the other hand, prominent figures on the Allied side, such as Foch, criticized the treaty for treating Germany too leniently. The result of these competing and sometimes conflicting goals among the victors was a compromise that left no one satisfied, and in particular Germany was neither completely pacified nor appeased, nor was it permanently weakened. The Treaty of Versailles has sometimes been cited as a cause of World War II. Although its actual impact was not as severe as feared, its terms led to great resentment in Germany, which enabled the rise of Adolf Hitler and his fascist party, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, also known as the Nazis. Another result of the peace conference was the League of Nations, the first worldwide intergovernmental organization whose principal mission was to maintain world peace. It was founded on the 10th of January 1920. The organization's primary goals included preventing wars through collective security and disarmament and setting international disputes through negotiation and arbitration. The covenant of the League of Nations was signed on the 28th of June 1919 as part one of the Treaty of Versailles, and it became effective together with the rest of the treaty on the 10th of January 1920. The diplomatic philosophy behind the League represented a fundamental shift from the preceding 100 years. The League lacked its own armed force and depended on their victorious allies to enforce its resolutions, to keep to its economic sanctions, or provide an army when needed. The Allied powers were often reluctant to do so. Sanctions could hurt League members, so they were reluctant to comply with them. After some notable successes and some early failures in the 1920s, the League ultimately proved incapable of preventing aggression by Japan, Italy and Germany in the 1930s. The credibility of the organization was weakened by the fact that the United States never joined the League and the Soviet Union joined late and was soon expelled after invading Finland. Germany withdrew from the League, as did Japan, Italy, Spain and others. The onset of the Second World War showed that the League had failed its primary purpose, which was to prevent any future world war. The United Nations, or UN, replaced it after the end of the Second World War. The aftermath of World War I and the resultant peace treaties saw drastic political, cultural, economic and social change across Europe, Asia, Africa and even in areas outside those that were directly involved. Four empires collapsed due to the war, namely Russia, Austria-Hungary, Imperial Germany and the Ottoman Empires. Old countries were abolished, new ones were formed, Boundaries were redrawn and many new and old ideologies took a firm hold in people's minds. World War I also had the effect of bringing political transformation to most of the principal parties involved in the conflict, transforming them into electoral democracies by bringing near universal suffrage for the first time in history. For almost eight months from the armistice in November 1918 until the signing of the Treaty of Versailles in June 1919, the Allies maintained the naval blockade of Germany that had begun during the war. N.P. Howard of the University of Sheffield claims that a quarter of a million died from disease or starvation in the eight-month period following the end of the war up until the lifting of the blockade. The terms of the armistice did allow food to be shipped into Germany but the Allies required that Germany provide the ships to do so. The German government was required to use its gold reserves, being unable to secure a loan from the United States. Historian Sally Marx claims that while Allied warships remained in place against a possible resumption of hostilities, the Allies offered food and medicine after the armistice, but Germany re refused to allow its ships to carry supplies. Further, Marx states that despite the problems facing the Allies from the German government, Allied food shipments arrived in Allied ships before the charge made at Versailles. This position is also supported by Elizabeth Glaser, 
who notes that an Allied task force to help feed the German population was established in early 1919 and that by May 1919, Germany became the chief recipient of American and Allied food shipments. Glaser further claims that during the early months of 1919, while the main relief effort was being planned, France provided food shipments to the German provinces of Bavaria and the Rhineland. She further claims that the German government delayed the relief effort by refusing to surrender their merchant fleet to the Allies. Finally, she concludes that the very success of the relief effort had in fact deprived the Allies of a credible threat to induce Germany to sign the Treaty of Versailles. However, it's also the case that for eight months following the end of hostilities, the blockade was continually in place, causing German civilians to starve to death on top of the hundreds of thousands of civilian casualties which already had occurred due to the blockade during the war. Food shipments, furthermore, had been entirely dependent on Allied goodwill and thus could be controlled by the Allies. Historians continue to argue about the impact that the 1918 flu pandemic had on the outcome of the First World War. It has been posited that the Central Powers may have been exposed to the viral wave before the Allies, their casualties having greater effect having been incurred during the war, as opposed to the Allies who suffered the brunt of the pandemic after the armistice. When the extent of the epidemic was realized, the respective censorship programs of the Allies and Central Powers limited the public's knowledge regarding the true extent of the disease. Because Spain was neutral, their media was free to report on the flu, giving the impression that it began there. This misunderstanding led to contemporary reports naming it the Spanish flu. Investigative work by a British team led by virologist John Oxford of St. Bartholomew's Hospital and the Royal London Hospital identified a major troop staging and hospital camp in Etapes, France as almost certainly being the center of the 1918 flu pandemic. A significant precursor virus was harbored in birds and mutated to pigs that were kept near the front. The exact number of deaths is unknown, but about 50 million people are estimated to have died from the influenza outbreak worldwide. In 2005, a study found that the 1918 virus strain developed in birds and was similar to the bird flu of the 21st century, which spurred fears of another worldwide pandemic, yet proved to be a normal treatable virus that did not produce a heavy impact on the world's health. However, a lot of comparisons have also been made between the Spanish flu and the COVID-19 pandemic that the world is currently experiencing, including the official reactions and policies of the so-called superpowers in containing the respective pandemics. The dissolution of the German, Russian, Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires created a number of new countries in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Some of them, such as Czechoslovakia and Poland, had substantial ethnic minorities who were sometimes not fully satisfied with the new boundaries that cut them off from fellow ethnics. For example, Czechoslovakia had Germans, Poles, Ruthenians, Ukrainians, Slovaks, and Hungarians. The League of Nations sponsored various minority treaties in an attempt to deal with the problem, but with the decline of the League in the 1930s, these treaties became increasingly unenforceable. One consequence of the massive redrawing of borders and the political changes in the aftermath of the war was the large number of European refugees. These and the refugees of the Russian Civil War led to the creation of the Nansen Passport. Ethnic minorities made the location of the frontiers generally unstable. Where the frontiers have remained unchanged since 1918, there has often been the expulsion of an ethnic group, such as the Sudeten Germans. Economic and military cooperation among these small states were minimal, ensuring that the defeated powers of Germany and the Soviet Union retained a latent capacity to dominate the region. 
In the immediate aftermath of the war, defeat drove cooperation between Germany and the Soviet Union, but ultimately these two powers would compete to dominate Eastern Europe. Approximately 1.5 million Armenians, native inhabitants of Armenian Highland, were nearly eliminated in Turkey as a result of the genocide of Armenians committed by the Young Turk government. A far-left and often explicitly communist revolutionary wave occurred in several European countries in 1917 to 1920, notably in Germany and Hungary. However, the single most important revolution sparked by the results of World War I was of course the Russian Revolution. The Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, or the SFSR, benefited from Germany's loss because one of the first terms of the armistice was the annulment of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. At the time of the armistice, Russia was in the grips of the Russian Civil War, which devastated the entire country. Russia as a whole suffered socially and economically. Due to this political upheaval, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia gained their independence. However, they were occupied again by the Soviet Union in 1940. Finland gained a lasting independence, though she repeatedly had to fight the Soviet Union for her borders. Armenia, Georgia and Azerbaijan were established as independent states in the Caucasus region. However, after the withdrawal of the Russian army in 1917 and during the 1920 Turkish invasion of Armenia, Turkey captured the Armenian territory around Artvin, Kars and Igdir and these territorial losses became permanent. As a consequence of a series of invasions by Turkey and the Russian Red Army, all three Transcaucasian countries were proclaimed as Soviet republics in 1920 and over time were absorbed into the Soviet Union. Romania gained the territory of Bessarabia from Russia. The Russians also conceded their part of Tianjin in China. This territory was occupied by the Chinese in 1920. In 1924, the Soviet Union renounced its claims to the district. In Germany, there was a socialist revolution which led to the brief establishment of a number of communist political systems in parts of the country, the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II and ultimately the creation of the Weimar Republic in November 1918. On the 28th of June 1919, the Weimar Republic was forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles. Germany viewed the one-sided treaty as a humiliation and as blaming it for the war. While the intent of the treaty was to assign guilt to Germany to justify financial reparations, the notion of blame took root as a political issue in German society and was never accepted by nationalists. 132 billion gold marks were demanded from Germany in reparations, of which only 50 billion had to be paid. In order to finance the purchases of foreign currency required to pay off the reparations, the new German Republic printed tremendous amounts of money, which had disastrous consequences. Hyperinflation plagued Germany between 1921 and 1923. In this period, the worth of Papier marks, with respect to the earlier commodity of gold marks, was reduced to one trillionth of its value. In December 1922, the Reparations Commission declared Germany in default and on the 11th of January 1923, French and Belgian troops occupied the Ruhr area of Germany until 1925. The treaty required Germany to permanently reduce the size of its army to 100,000 men and destroy their tanks, air force and U-boat fleet her capital ships moored at Scapa Flow were scuttled by their crews to prevent them from falling into Allied hands. Germany saw relatively small amounts of territory transferred to Denmark, Czechoslovakia and Belgium, a larger amount to France including the temporary French occupation of the Rhineland and the greatest portion as part of a re-established Poland. Germany's overseas colonies were divided between a number of allied countries, most notably to the British in Africa. But it was the loss of the territory that composed a newly independent Polish state, including the German city of Danzig 
and the separation of East Prussia from the rest of Germany that caused the greatest outrage. Nazi propaganda would feed on a general German view that the treaty was unfair and thus fueled the rise of Hitler and the fall of the Weimar Republic in 1933. With the war having turned decisively against the Central Powers, the people of Austria-Hungary lost faith in the countries that had been their allies and even before the armistice in November, radical nationalism had already led to several declarations of independence in South Central Europe after November 1918. As the central government had ceased to operate in vast areas, these regions found themselves without a government, and many new groups attempted to fill the void. During this same period, the population was facing food shortages and was, for the most part, demoralized by the losses incurred during the war. Various political parties, ranging from ardent nationalists to social democrats to communists, attempted to set up governments in the name of the different nationalities. In other areas, existing nation-states such as Romania tried to claim regions that they considered to be theirs. These moves created de facto governments that complicated life for diplomats, idealists and the victorious allied powers. The Western forces were officially supposed to occupy the old empire but rarely had enough troops to do so effectively. They had to deal with local authorities who had their own agenda to fulfill. At the peace conference in Paris, the diplomats had to reconcile these authorities with the competing demands of the nationalists who had turned to them for help during the war, the strategic or political desires of the Western allies themselves, and other agendas such as the desire to implement the spirit of the 14 points. For example, in order to live up to the ideal of self-determination laid out in Wilson's 14 points, Germans, whether Austrian or German, should be able to decide their own future and government. However, the French especially were concerned that an expanded Germany would be a huge security risk. Further complicating the situation, delegations such as the Czechs and Slovenians made strong claims on some German-speaking territories. The result was treaties that compromised many ideals, offended many allies, and set up an entirely new order in the area. Many people hoped that the new nation-states would allow for a new era of prosperity and peace in the region, free from the bitter quarrelling between nationalities that had marked the preceding 50 years. This hope proved to be far too optimistic. Changes in territorial configuration after World War I included the establishment of the Republic of German Austria and the Hungarian Democratic Republic disavowing any continuity with the empire and exiling the Habsburg royal family in perpetuity. Eventually, after 1920, the new borders of Hungary did not include approximately two-thirds of the lands of the former Kingdom of Hungary. The new Republic of Austria maintained control over most of the predominantly German-controlled areas but lost various other German-majority lands in what was the Austrian Empire. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Slavonia, Dalmatia, Slovenia, Sirmia, parts of Bakhsbadrog, Baranja, Torontal, and Thames counties were joined with Serbia to form the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, later Yugoslavia. Transylvania, parts of Banat, Krisana, and Maramures, and Bokovina became part of Romania. The Austria-Hungarian concession in Tianjin, China was ceded to the Republic of China. These changes were recognized in, but not caused, by the Treaty of Versailles. They were subsequently further elaborated in the Treaty of Saint-Germain and the Treaty of Trianon. The 1919 treaties generally included guarantees of minority rights, but there was no enforcement mechanism. The new states of Eastern Europe mostly all had large ethnic minorities. Millions of Germans found themselves in the newly created countries as minorities. More than 2 million ethnic Hungarians found themselves living outside of Hungary in Czechoslovakia, Romania and the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats and Slovenes. 
Many of these national minorities found themselves in hostile situations because the modern governments were intent on defining the national character of the countries, often at the expense of the other nationalities. The interwar years were hard for religious minorities in the new states built around ethnic nationalism. The Jews were especially distrusted because of their minority religion and distinct subculture. Although anti-Semitism had been widespread during Habsburg rule, Jews faced no official discrimination because they were, for the most part, ardent supporters of the multinational state and the monarchy. The economic disruption of the war and the end of the Austro-Hungarian Union created great hardship in many areas. Although many states were set up as democracies after the war, one by one, with the exception of Czechoslovakia, they reverted to some form of authoritarian rule. Many quarreled amongst themselves, but were too weak to compete effectively. Later, when Germany rearmed, the nation-states of South Central Europe were unable to resist its attacks and fell under German domination to a much greater extent than had ever existed in Austria-Hungary. At the end of the war, the Allies occupied Constantinople, later renamed Istanbul, and the Ottoman government collapsed. The Treaty of Sevres, designed to repair damage caused by Ottomans during the war to the winning Allies, was signed by the Ottoman Empire on the 10th of August 1920, but was never ratified by Sultan Mehmed. The occupation of Smyrna by Greece on the 18th of May 1919 triggered a nationalist movement to rescind the terms of the treaty. Turkish revolutionaries led by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk rejected the terms enforced at Sevres and under the guise of General Inspector of the Ottoman Army, left Istanbul for Samsun to organize the remaining Ottoman forces to resist the terms of the treaty. On the Eastern Ottoman Front, after the invasion of Armenia in 1920 and the signing of the Treaty of Kars with the Russian SFSR, Turkey took over the territory lost to Armenia and Communist Russia. On the Western Ottoman Front, the growing strength of the Turkish nationalist forces led Greece, with the backing of Britain, to invade deep into Anatolia in an attempt to deal a blow to the revolutionaries. At the Battle of Dum Lupinar, the Greek army was defeated and forced into retreat, leading to the burning of Smyrna and the withdrawal of Greece from Asia Minor. With the nationalists empowered, the army marched on to reclaim Istanbul, resulting in the Shanak crisis in 1922, after which British Prime Minister David Lloyd George was forced to resign. After Turkish resistance gained control over Anatolia and Istanbul, the Sevres Treaty was superseded by the Treaty of Lausanne of 1923, which formally ended all hostilities and led to the creation of the modern Turkish Republic. As a result, Turkey became the only power of World War I to overturn the terms of its defeat and negotiate with the Allies as an equal. The Lausanne Treaty formally acknowledged the new League of Nations mandate in the Middle East the cession of their territories on the Arabian Peninsula, and British sovereignty over Cyprus. The League of Nations granted Class A mandates for the French mandate of Syria and Lebanon, and the British mandate of Mesopotamia and Palestine, the latter comprising two autonomous regions, Mandate Palestine and the Emirate of Transjordan. Parts of the Ottoman Empire on the Arabian Peninsula became part of what is today Saudi Arabia and Yemen. The dissolution of the Ottoman Empire became a pivotal milestone in the creation of the modern Middle East, the result of which bore witness to the creation of new conflicts and hostilities in the region. For example, the British and French promised different things to the Arabs and the Jews in return for their support against the Ottoman Empire. Under the Sykes-Picot Agreement, London and Paris carved out respective spheres of influence in what was to become Iraq, Syria and Lebanon. But at the same time, the British promised the Jews a homeland in Palestine under the Balfour Declaration, laying the foundations for the emergence of Israel and the world's most unresolvable modern conflict. When the British deceit was exposed, 
it led to a permanent feeling of mistrust between many Arabs and European colonial powers. Many analysts point to the European carve-up of the Middle East in 1918, with the many artificial borders, as the root cause of the continuing turmoil in the region today. Ethnic, sectarian and tribal differences were of little concern to the colonial era mapmakers. Iraq was formed by emerging three Ottoman provinces, dominated respectively by Shias, Sunnis and Kurds. It was also cut off from Kuwait, the genesis of trouble later. The biggest losers of the post-war lottery in the Middle East were the Kurds. To this day, these people are still without a state but enjoy a high degree of regional autonomy as well as relative peace in federal Iraq, while their compatriots in Syria and Turkey face challenges from those respective governments. Meanwhile, the British and French colonial empires reached their peaks after World War I. In the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, funding the war had a severe economic cost. From being the world's largest overseas investor, it became one of its biggest debtors, with interest payments forming around 40% of all government spending. Inflation more than doubled between 1914 and 1920, while the value of the pound sterling, which is the British currency, fell by 61.2%. War reparations in the form of free German coal caused the local coal industry to shrink, leading to the 1926 general strike. British private investments abroad were sold, raising £550 million. However, £250 million in new investment also took place during the war. The net financial loss was therefore approximately £300 million, less than two years' investment compared to the pre-war average rate and more than replaced by 1928. Material loss was slight, the most significant being 40% of the British merchant fleet sunk by German U-boats. Most of this was also replaced in 1918, and all immediately after the war. The military historian Corelli Barnett has argued that in objective truth, the Great War in no way inflicted crippling economic damage on Britain, but that the war crippled the British psychologically, but in no other way. Less concrete changes, including the growing assertiveness of Commonwealth nations, with battles such as Gallipoli for Australia and New Zealand, led to increased national pride and a greater reluctance to remain subordinate to Britain, leading to the growth of diplomatic autonomy in the 1920s. These battles were often decorated in propaganda in these nations as symbolic of their power during the war. Colonies such as the British Raj of India and Nigeria also became increasingly assertive because of their participation in the war. The populations in these countries became increasingly aware of their own power and Britain's fragility. In Ireland, the delay in finding a resolution to the Home Rule issue, exacerbated by the government's severe response to the 1916 Easter Rising and its failed attempt to introduce conscription in Ireland in 1918, led to an increased support for separatist radicals. This led indirectly to the outbreak of the Irish War of Independence in 1919. The creation of the Irish Free State that followed this conflict, in effect, represented a territorial loss for Britain that actually equaled the territorial loss sustained by Germany. Despite this, the Irish Free State remained a dominion within the British Empire. After World War I, Women over 30 gained the right to vote since during the war they had had to occupy what were previously categorized as men's jobs, thus showing the government that women were not as weak and incompetent as they thought. In France, Alsace-Lorraine, the region which had been ceded to Prussia in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War was returned to French hands. At the 1919 peace conference, Prime Minister George Clemenceau's aim was to ensure that Germany would not seek revenge in the following years. To this purpose, the chief commander of the Allied forces, Ferdinand Foch, had demanded that for the future protection of France, the Rhine River should now form the border between France and Germany. Based on history, he was convinced that Germany would again become a threat in the future. 
The destruction brought upon French territory was to be covered by the reparations negotiated at Versailles. This financial imperative dominated France's foreign policy throughout the 1920s, leading to the 1923 occupation of the Ruhr in order to force Germany to pay. However, Germany was unable to pay. Also, extremely important in the war was the participation of French colonial troops, who amounted to around 10% of the total number of troops deployed by France across the war including the Senegalese Terroriers and troops from Indochina, North Africa and Madagascar. When these soldiers returned to their homelands and continued to be treated as second-class citizens, many became the nuclei of pro-independence groups. Furthermore, under the state of war declared during the hostilities, the French economy had been somewhat centralized in order to be able to shift into a war economy leading to a first breach with classical liberalism. Finally, the socialist support of the National Union government, including Alexander Millerand's nomination as Minister of War, marked a shift towards the French section of the Workers' Internationals, or SFIO, its turn towards social democracy and participation in bourgeois governments. In 1882, Italy joined with the German Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire to form the Triple Alliance. However, the Italians were keen to acquire Trentino and Trieste, parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire populated by Italians. During World War I, Italy aligned with the Allied powers instead of joining Germany and Austria. This could happen since the Triple Alliance was formally defensive in nature, while the Central Empires were viewed as the ones who started the offensive. With the Treaty of London, Britain secretly offered Italy Trentino and Tyrol as far as Brenner, Trieste and Istria, all the Dalmatian coast except Fiume, full ownership of Albanian Valona and a protectorate over Albania, Antalya in Turkey and a share of the Turkish and German colonial empire in exchange for Italy siding against the central empires. After the victory, Vittorio Orlando, Italy's president, and Sidney Sonino, its foreign minister, were sent as the Italian representatives to Paris with the aim of gaining the promised territories and as much other land as possible. In particular, there was an especially strong opinion about the status of Fiume, which they believed was rightly Italian due to the Italian population in agreement with Wilson's 14 points, with the ninth of which reading, a readjustment of the frontiers of Italy should be effected along clearly recognizable lines of nationality. Nevertheless, by the end of the war, the Allies realized that they had made contradictory agreements with other nations, especially regarding Central Europe and the Middle East. In the meetings of the Big Four, the great powers were only willing to offer Trentino to the Brenner the Dalmatian port of Zara, the island of Lagosta, and a couple of small German colonies. All other territories were promised to other nations, and the great powers were worried about Italy's imperial ambitions. Wilson, in particular, was a staunch supporter of Yugoslav rights in Dalmatia against Italy. As a result of this, Orlando left the conference in a rage. This simply favoured Britain and France, who divided among themselves the former Ottoman and German territories in Africa. In Italy, the discontent was relevant. Irredentism became overarching policy in Italy. It claimed Fiume and Dalmatia as Italian lands. Many Italians felt that the country had taken part in a meaningless war without getting any serious benefits. This idea of a mutilated victory or Vittoria Mutolata, was the reason which led to the Impresa di Fiume, or Fiumi exploit. On the 12th of September 1919, the nationalist poet Gabriel da Annunzio led around 2,600 troops from the Royal Italian Army, or the Granatieri de Sardegna, nationalists and irredentists, into a seizure of the city of Fiume, forcing the withdrawal of the inter-allied American, British and French, occupying forces. 
The mutilated victory became an important part of Italian fascism propaganda on their road to taking over the Italian government with Benito Mussolini as their leader in 1922. The experiences of the war in the West are commonly assumed to have led to a sort of collective national trauma afterward for all of the participating countries. The optimism of 1900 was entirely gone and those who fought became what is known as the lost generation because they never fully recovered from their suffering. For the next few years much of Europe mourned privately and publicly. Memorials were erected in thousands of villages and towns. As early as 1923, Stanley Baldwin recognized a new strategy of reality that faced Britain in a disarmament speech. Poison gas and the aerial bombing of civilians were developments of the First World War. The British civilian population, for many centuries, had not had any serious reason to fear invasion. So the new threat of poison gas dropped from enemy bombers excited a grossly exaggerated view of the civilian deaths that would occur on the outbreak of any future war. Baldwin expressed this in his statement that the bomber will always get through. The traditional British policy of a balance of power in Europe no longer safeguarded the British home population. Out of this fear came appeasement. It's notable that neither Baldwin nor Neville Chamberlain fought in the war, but the anti-appeasers Anthony Eden, Harold Macmillan, and Winston Churchill did. One gruesome reminder of the sacrifices of the generation was the fact that this was one of the first times in international conflict whereby more men died in battle than from disease, which was the main cause of deaths in most previous wars. This social trauma made itself manifest in many different ways. Some people were revolted by nationalism and what they believed it had caused, so they began to work toward a more internationalist world through organizations such as the League of Nations. Passivism became increasingly popular. Others had the opposite reaction, feeling that only military strength could be relied upon for protection in a chaotic and inhumane world that did not respect the hypothetical notions of civilization. Certainly, a sense of disillusionment and cynicism became pronounced. Nihilism grew in popularity. Many people believed that the war heralded the end of the world as they had known it, including the collapse of capitalism and imperialism. Communist and socialist movements around the world drew strength from this theory, enjoying a level of popularity they had never known before. These feelings were most pronounced in areas directly or particularly harshly affected by the war, such as Central Europe, Russia and France. Artists such as Otto Dix, George Gross, Ernst Barlach and Kate Kollwitz represented their experiences or those of their society in blunt paintings and sculpture, part of the newest Starkerkate or New Objectivity art movement. Dada art also developed in reaction to the horrors of World War I. The Dada movement consisted of artists who rejected the logic, reason and the aestheticism of the modern capitalist society, instead expressing nonsense, irrationality and anti-bourgeois protest in their works. Similarly, authors such as Eric Maria Remarque wrote grim novels detailing their experiences. These works had a strong impact on society causing a great deal of controversy and highlighting conflicting interpretations of the war. In Germany, nationalists, including the Nazis, believed that much of this work was degenerate and undermined the cohesion of society as well as dishonoring the dead. The large numbers of men returning from the war with emotional trauma as a result of what they had seen and experienced also horrified the society they came back to. This led doctors to start to study this emotional as opposed to the physical stress of war. Shell shock and traumatic shock were identified as common symptoms. But despite these insights and countless more sufferers in the Second World War, it was not until the aftermath of the Vietnam War that this condition 
was formerly recognized as post-traumatic stress disorder. The social impact that shell shock had on nuclear families of returning soldiers was devastating and many times irreversible. More than a century after World War I, throughout the areas where trenches and fighting lines were located, quantities of unexploded ordnance have remained, some of which remain dangerous, continuing to cause injuries and occasional deaths well into the 21st century. Some are found by farmers plowing their fields and have been called the iron harvest. Some of this ammunition contains toxic chemical products or they explode when unwitting farmers plow their fields. Hundreds of tons of unexploded ammunition from both world wars have been removed and diffused every year in Belgium, France and Germany with no clear end in sight. The shadow of 1914 to 1918 is still present in Europe today. Perhaps the biggest change up until recently was that military power was far less significant in European politics than it was in 1914. There was little to no appetite for using force to achieve political goals. Defense spending remains low. Following the end of the Cold War in 1991, the numbers in Europe's armed forces have been dramatically reduced and despite Russian incursions into Ukraine, there is little or no appetite to increase numbers. However, after Russia's full-scale military invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, European member states of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, most notably Germany, France and Britain, may review their stances. The First World War had an immense impact on how the world would be shaped in future. Empires fell, new empires rose, and others began a slow decline. New borders were drawn on maps as territories grew, diminished, or splintered into new territories altogether. Inevitably, this hash redrawing of maps would lead to new conflicts, some that are still continuing to this day. Moreover, populist movements took hold of Europe in the wake of the First World War taking advantage of the social and economic devastation caused by the war. The rise of fascism swept over Western Europe, eventually taking over governments in Italy, Spain and Germany. Fascism gave the people an outlet for their frustrations and anger as a result of the volatile situation they found themselves in. It also usually provided them with a scapegoat, someone to blame for their misfortune usually an outsider or a minority group. The fascist movement sent the masses into a frenzy with talk of victimhood and the restoration of national pride. This eventually led to rearmament and aggressive foreign policy, sending Europe and the world once more on a collision course towards war. In contrast, the war also saw the increase in international sentiment, culminating in an international organization dedicated to keep the peace. However, the League of Nations would fail and the world would be plunged back into global conflict 20 years after the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. This conflict would be even more devastating in scale than World War I and would see the introduction of new horrifying weapons such as the atom bomb and the refining of older weapons technologies. World War I was meant to be the war to end all wars. But, in reality, it only served to expose the fault lines across which future conflict were to erupt from. As David Lloyd George remarked, this war, like the next war, is a war to end war. It only took one assassination of a high-end official from one empire to create a domino effect of plunging the world into war. But have we truly learned from the mistakes made in World War I? This is a question you need to ask yourselves not only in relation to the First World War, but to any major conflict that the world has seen since 1918. We say that World War II was the war to put an end to populist fascism. Yet, we have a resurgence of fascist movements all around the world, not only on the far right of the political spectrum, but also on the far left. Even in South Africa, the presence and rise of these movements threatens to destroy democracy and rescind the basic human rights found in the Constitution. 
We say that never again would we allow the horrors of the Holocaust to be repeated. Yet we allowed the extermination of Tutsis at the hands of the majority Hutus in Rwanda, not even 50 years later. The slaughter of thousands of Sudanese in Darfur, the killing of Syrian civilians by their own state, the persecution of the Uyghur Muslims in China as of the 23rd of July 2020, and the deliberate targeting of civilians by Russian troops and Russian-backed separatists in the war currently underway in Ukraine, just to name a few recent atrocities. In addition, if the conflict continues to escalate in the last mentioned conflict, where it pulls in other countries such as the United States and other NATO members as belligerents, the risk of a nuclear confrontation will be at its highest since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. It's for this reason that the First World War is perhaps the most significant. This global conflict for the first time raised the stakes of human cohabitation. For the first time the world realized collectively that the only thing that limited the means of self-annihilation was our own imagination. This is why understanding the causes of war as well as its course and its consequences are so important in understanding our capabilities as humanity. Perhaps then, when politicians romanticize war as the good fight and call us to support it, we may take a step back and understand what that might mean for us. Let us understand that sacrifice is not glorious. It never was and it never will be. Three years before the advent of the Second World War in 1936, US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt delivered a speech in which he recounted his experiences of the First World War. His speech was a clarion call for peace, a call to reason, a warning. Perhaps now, our leaders who are taking us to the verge of another global conflict should take his warning seriously. We who inhabit this earth today should take his warning seriously. I have seen war. I have seen war on land and sea. I have seen blood running from the wounded. I have seen men coughing out their gassed lungs. I have seen the dead in the mud. I have seen cities destroyed. I have seen 200 limping, exhausted men come out of line. The survivors of a regiment of 1,000 that went forward 48 hours before. I have seen children starving. I have seen the agony of mothers and wives. I hate war.